Um, look, I guess I'm going to bring this back a fair bit to that stakeholder engagement from an extremely low level at some points um, that got up to that point at the National Wild Dog uh, Management Action Plan. Um, we embarked in this issue because of the already escalating conflict between <laughs> stakeholders, um, land managers and management implications. And in fact, the last time I was in this room, I was giving a presentation on the risk of losing 1082 vertebrate pest control to the Vet Australian Veterinary Association. So that was an interesting presentation as well. So just to, I guess, put it into context, um, in 2007, I commenced, um, of all the vertebrate pests in Australia, none invoke the despair and anger like that of wild dogs. Um, conservative estimates around 120 million um, through direct predation, livestock disease, control cost, downgrading of carcasses of processing. Um, I was meant to actually, sorry Robert, I was meant to mention that there could be some confronting images. Um, but the whole issue is confronting and that's the reality. Um, wild dogs and dingoes impact individuals economically uh, through animal welfare and emotional and psychological well-being, as well as having significant impacts on um, rural communities. Unlike foxes and feral pigs uh, that prey on lambs and goats, uh, wild dogs attack and kill all age groups of sheep and goats, so they get to the point where they actually render production entities unviable. And um, same similar point that Kath made earlier, that when you've got a third generation sheep producer that has to leave the industry for the first time um, and he's sitting there in tears because he's about to load the last deck of sheep off the property, it's, it's fairly confronting. We've even seen tax on cattle so great in places that they can no longer produce calves and they have to, to shift their operation from one of breeding to a finishing operation. The problem being that dogs are highly mobile, they move between properties uh, regularly, uh, making it very difficult um, for landholders to control on their own. And in fact, we had ABARES conduct some research for us back in 2015 looking at an impact of event scale rating on trauma and of the, the landholders that were exposed to continuous wild dog attacks on their livestock, they actually suffered um, emotional trauma similar to that of a, a major motor vehicle survivor or a returned Vietnam veteran. So we're talking about significant impacts emotionally as well as, um, as, well as economically. Those landholders, as I said, feel impacted, feel anxious, they're isolated, they become angry, they just want someone to fix the bloody problem. Um, the issue is shrouded in conflict at all levels. Um, we're dealing at the labour versus neighbour, um, landholder versus public land manager, and even between government agencies in some states and jurisdictions. So given the amount of volatility in this contested space, it was always going to be a tough gig to try and develop partnerships and shared responsibilities between the stakeholders to effectively manage the problem. In terms of the national project, it was about, I guess, a, a behaviour change. So from a social um, licence perspective, we had to generate that within the, the stakeholders we were dealing with already. Um, this is what the national project was about, looking at ways that we could re-engage with those, those disenfranchised stakeholders. Um, we required it across all the groups. It wasn't just the landholders that, that we needed to work with, it was across all the stakeholder groups and jurisdictions involved. We had to rebuild and develop that trust um, that was completely eroded and undermined in a lot of places where we worked. Um, and I guess one of the, the consistencies in terms of the project was my role. Um, in the 10 years I've been in this role, I've been through uh, two federal government elections, there's been at least three state elections in each place, numerous restructures of the agencies and organisations involved in management, and then there's the poor landholder groups still trying to manage dogs and dealing with a new person every second year. So my role was really one of, of consistency that could provide them with that support to keep pushing through even though things are tough. In terms of building that credibility, we had a, a national approach that was implemented in 2007. Um, the Invasive Animals CRC created a project back then called Facilitating the Strategic Approach to Management of Wild Dogs Across Australia and part of that was the employment of this national facilitator role that I'm in. The national approach was one that was developed on a, a nil tenure platform as we called it back then to engage with stakeholders both private, public and government, taking away land ownership which was a big issue in terms of the wild dog space. We knew it worked because we'd rolled it out in um, the Snowy Mountains and Kosciuszko National Park in areas with long-term historical conflict between neighbours and particularly the public land managers. Um, 
it was so, um, so much conflict in the area that in the first week of my job as a pest management officer with the New South Wales Parks, I was threatened to be shot at twice in the one week. Um, and it's amazing how your perspective on community engagement changes when you're looking down the barrel of a gun. So that was my introduction to um, Wild Dog Management 101 and automatically showed that these people were frustrated at not being heard, not being dealt with adequately. The Nilton process worked in that landscape to manage that conflict, so it was adopted nationally as a way forward. In 2009, oh sorry, so we knew the approach worked at the local level, um, rolling that out nationally and getting acceptance and adopt adoption at that level really required further investment and engagement with industry uh, and we needed someone to champion that cause. So in 2009 I formed a National Wild Dog Advisory Group. Uh, the group was comprised of all the state agencies involved directly in wild dog management, but also a number of landholders who were either currently or, or had previously been in, um, experienced wild dog attacks on their livestock. So these people were already people that were scarred or traumatised or had um, significant negative impacts in terms of the whole process. Those landholders were asked to represent state farming bodies, so we, we definitely wanted people that could come and articulate what they'd felt what they'd been through, the frustrations, and then take that back through the industry to try and promote it. Um, it was imperative for me that, that these people were involved in the process. We needed people who were involved and impacted to be part of that solution. The important thing with a national group, though, in this instance, was to get people out of their backyards. Um, people become very insular about what the issue is and what it means to them from their experience. And when we want someone in a national perspective, we need to take them outside and take them to other parts of the world. It's very different to the areas where Matt used to farm at Corion compared to the Flinders Ranges in South Australia and, and the rangelands of, of central western Queensland. But what that did was it, it uh, gave members of that group opportunities to, to liaise and network with each other. They became in the, confident in the approach, the nil tenure approach that we wanted to deliver. Um, they became aware of each other's circumstances, roles, and their capacities to influence both change within the community and within government. And that was a, an important step forward because often landholders think that government people can change policy and direction in an instant just because there's an issue at hand. Um, the support um, for these members of the industry became champions pretty quickly. Um, and Jeff Power, who received an award last night, was one of those guys. Um, each one of those industry people turned up to their first meeting chest puffed out, going to tell the government how they were going to fix it all um, from their past experience and within a day or two of that meeting they were all chilled out, sitting back, working collectively and cooperatively. Um, and they never had that experience in a lot of cases. The support from the industry also encouraged governments to actually commit to making change. Um, they'd been so um, abused, um, put on the spot that for a lot of them the, the risk of making change in that volatile situation was that it would come back to bite them in a public backlash. But the trust and support developed through this group itself um, soon opened the door for me to begin working at local community groups as they started to promote ownership of the issue and getting people to be part of the solution. In terms of re-engaging at the lower level, um, that's where the, the work really came into play. Um, I think we did a bit of a dive on this, Catherine. Um, we, we declared the situation, we declared the problems, we declared um, what was involved in the nil tenure process. Um, that, from our perspective, that dogs don't obey boundaries opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, we brought those landholders together, we used the information we had from the science and research, we incorporated that into field days and, and best practice management days. Um, we developed that trust and, and, and that uh, credibility amongst those stakeholders that we were actually here to work with them to try and solve their problem. Um, we weren't going to come in and fix it for them. But we gave them the skills to do it. And in that process, we, we got those people to re-engage with the stakeholders and the government agencies that you know, six months ago they were trying to string up in a tree. So it was a hugely important process to go forward. And that nil tenure process was important to make them realise that at the end of the day, they were all in it together and it was a shared responsibility. That quote there um, from a Victorian wild dog controller, you would not have heard a, Vict a wild dog controller five years ago say that he was quite happy to catch half the dogs he got the year before and put out baits. So even the government agents had confidence in the, the re-engagement that we did and were quite willing to say that, you know, we'll accept the change and we'll apply it and see how it goes. We also shifted the measure of success and um, previously to this project, the measure of success was what I called a cricket score mentality. It was all about how many dogs have we killed this year? 
it had no reference to the impact or the asset that they were trying to protect. Uh, and through this process, we managed to change their outlook to oh, how many sheep have we saved? And that was also a very big change in, in approach. But once again, more importantly, they start to take ownership of the issues themselves. They work together in a cooperative fashion. Um, and even though wild dogs were still in present, they weren't wreaking the same havoc that they did previously. So just quickly, um, the another big issue about my role is that you can't expect landholders to adopt and accept change and, and in, uh, in one or two sessions. You've got to keep going back. Uh, they're time poor. They have contested space. And realistically, you've got to go back on numerous occasions sometimes to influence them enough or give them enough information to, to justify a change in approach. Um, I think it's a big flaw in some of our extension programs and, and it's a bit of the dad situation where we go in there and we tell them how to suck eggs six different ways and ask them to choose one. Um, sorry, but that's how I see it. Um, these guys have to be part of that solution. It's got to be something that they agree to and, and despite all of the best practice that we have at the end of the day, they have to work amongst themselves to see how that's going to operate at their level. The other thing that we did was created an independent um, safe space. Um, there's a paper around conflict uh, transformation and it, it discusses about three different levels of conflict. There's the surface level, there's the um, undermining and then there's the in-depth, ingrained level of conflict. And we're dealing with all of those levels in this space depending on how long people have been involved in the issue. So from an independent facilitator's perspective, we started to take on board a lot of those community engagement practices. In terms of the groups, and, and this gets back to the point that, that Kath made earlier, um, that group structure was so important for those local communities in terms of managing this issue, both mentally, economically and socially. Um, an ABES study that was undertaken by Sarnecker and her crew in 2015 showed that of the 35 groups that they interviewed, um, producers saw 67% believe they were highly effective, um, another 20% thought they were very, you know, medium effective, mediumly effective. The important thing was, though, that their idea of effectiveness wasn't related directly to stock loss. Um, members based their effectiveness on participation rates, uh, commitment and communication, and democratic decision-making processes that were involved in their group structures. Producers believe they were also far more strategic in their application of control um, and had better communication between their neighbours and between the agency staff involved. Um, and many of them believe that despite ongoing stock attacks, that their situation would have been far worse um, if they hadn't been part of a group and delivering their control. And once again, we start getting, you know, I guess, affirmation of how people feel by this comment from Philip about, you know, the only reason they got back into sheep was because of the work the whole of the community had done. And they're openly and happy to say that. So from that perspective, we had achieved our social licence at that local level. And until we have that, it's pretty difficult to take that any further. I sort of talked briefly about that face-to-face -face engagement and how essential that is and we've been sort of through that whole process in government and I was in government for a while where we went through the whole electronic engagement approach and fact sheets and, and uh, websites and all that stuff but when it comes to issues like this with that much conflict involved, face-to-face -face engagement's essential to build up that trust. It's exactly what the two ladies before me said, if the stakeholders don't have trust and faith in you and the approach that you're taking, then you can forget it. And from our experience, the best way to do that is through face-to-face -face and one-on-one -on -one engagement where necessary or through that group structure. Um, that same study found that coordinators and facilitator support was critical for them to adopt any sort of a change. Um, once again, we broker agreement and manage conflict. Um, I've never met, uh, well, in this, in this space, there's, there's always an underlying conflict that you're not expecting when you walk into a room and, and somehow or another, you've got to try and manage that. Once again, creating that, that space where everyone has a shared um, responsibility for the decision-making process. Um, and the outcome of my project early on in the days became so successful and um, was seen as being so productive that industry came on board and started to invest heavily in regional coordinators to pick up the gaps and the, the slack in places where government programs had uh, reduced their extension capacity. We now have seven regional wild dog coordinators across the country that are funded through Australian Wool Innovation. Uh, and more recently, we've got a number of um, co-invested projects, which is a bit of a coup, between state, local governments, as well as industry as well. So the process and, and the application of it 
has been quite effective. Okay. So I guess coming to the, the crux of it, um, industry taking only the issue, issue nationally was where we needed to get to and it took seven years for that to occur. Um, in 2013, the industry members on that national group decided they just could not afford to lose the traction they had made in this issue over the last seven years. And they decided to put the principles of the national approach into that national wild dog action plan. In 2014, Wool Producers Australia used levy funds to appoint a consultant and work with the national group to develop this plan. And as Matt mentioned before, it was um, developed, written, signed off and funded by the federal government in 12 months. However, I do have to caution that this did take seven years in the making. Um, and I do get concerned when I see industry groups and government agencies putting the, the National Wild Dog Action Plan up as an example of how biosecurity plans and national strategies can be developed in similar timeframes. Um, I can also assure you that you will have far greater success in getting a plan up and achieving your outcomes if it's driven from the ground up and not top down. And I think that's firmly one of the reasons why we've been so successful in our approach. We're now working hard to maintain, maintain our social licence more broader than the direct stakeholders through ongoing communications. And I'll be interested to talk to both of Kath and Catherine later to find out how to do that. Um, but one thing you can say, it's far easier to maintain a social licence um, and promote shared responsibilities when you finally have the stakeholders that have a common objectives and an agreed approach to go forward. In terms of that broader community perspective, um, we're really trying to move past, I guess, the issue and, and the dogs themselves and look at the people and the issue there. That comment there about no more photos of dead dogs in trees. Um, every time we had a media article for a period of time, whether it was a good one or a poor one in terms of wild dog management outcomes, we always had this ghastly photo of dead wild dog carcasses hanging in a tree and it was used everywhere. So from a broader community engagement perspective, it just completely undermined everything we did, regardless of the heading or the outcome of the actual article. So we're trying to move past that. We're focusing on the people and not the dogs. We're beginning to focus on the solution and not the problem. And it comes back to those personal values. People relate to other people's hardships and what they're going through, I think, more so than scientific evidence. And although we have the scientific evidence and data behind us to back us, We've changed their messaging approach, particularly in these sorts of articles, to engender that, that support from the broader community. In the past four years, we've seen a huge change in the, the um, reporting of media on this issue. And in fact, some of the state governments are using it as one of their KPIs because they've gone from complete horror stories every week and any opportunity to stick it to the government to these sorts of... Um, collective and cooperative types of responses in media that, that shows that actually things are working and everyone's working collectively. We've also seen landholders change their attitude too. There's no need to stick it to the government anymore when they're working well with them and they're, they're working in a cooperative um, shared partnership and that's been a fantastic change in their approach as well. Just finally, um, in terms of wrapping this up, the action plan term ceases in 2019. So we're about to start commencing our review process and consultation with the stakeholder groups. At the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to determine whether we need to continue on with this action plan or not, or whether it needs to evolve into something different than what we already have. The ongoing support from facilitated networks will always be there through industry to support those local groups. And we'll continue to work towards achieving that broader social licence with the help of people like Kath and Catherine, because it's not a space that we've been effectively in. Um, our focus has been on getting that licence at the, at the stakeholder level. And we've still got a way to go. We've got issues like this we have to start to contend with that start to erode the capacity for us to undertake management of, of a pest species on agriculture and other assets. We've got... I didn't even know this one was out there from Dingo Tom. I read a lot about Ding, from Dingo Tom, but he was actually trying to get the action plan canned when we were developing it. And then we have other supporters who just want to ban the poisons and the toxins and the, the management tools that we have available to us. So um, we've got a lot to go, but I'd like to just say thank you. And um, once again, um, it wouldn't have been possible without acknowledging all of these, these supporters and participants.